Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Eric, for inviting me to come here to the Lindell Hall Library. Uh, thank you all for coming out uh, for what should be a very fun, uh, fun evening. Um, I've just been honored to be here. Uh, it's an extraordinary institution. I got the chance this afternoon to spend some time with Eric and with the curator, Bill Ashworth, uh, looking through the exhibition and also uh, meeting many of the staff and, and exploring the stacks and these just incredible uh, resources um, that I am very tempted to come back again and explore when I have more time. Unfortunately, I have to leave tomorrow morning. Um, but this, the crayon and stone exhibition is very, very special to me. I mean, it is the intersection of art and science, my two favorite passions. And as I was going through there today, I just found so many gems. I, uh, Eric and Bill wanted to keep moving on, and they had to pull me away from uh, the different cases. And um, some of my, just the ones that stick out of my memory is, you know, Caitlin's um, four super large lithographs over in the, the East Room. Um, I love that they collaborated with the students to show that lithography is alive in 2013. It's, it's just a brilliant idea on behalf of everyone involved in the exhibition. Um, I also love the 15 color chromo lithograph butterflies. If you haven't seen them, that's just absurd. <laughs> 15 colors uh, for a butterfly. Let's check it out. I think that's in that room. There's also a life size fossil track lithograph that like goes over like an entire two pages of a book and apparently the artist who made that had made there's a smaller version and he just it wasn't cutting it he wasn't happy with the smaller version so he had to like go big and that's that's my style so i don't like that one but absolutely by far hands down my favorite piece that you have to see before you leave here tonight is this guy out for a stroll at mount vesuvius Oh, forecast calls for spewing magma and rocks. <laughs> so I'll put on my top hat and my white breeches and go out on this fragile crust of hardened lava and poke at the magma lava, whatever it is at this point, uh, with my walking stick. Which is, if you can see clearly, it's like starting to be incinerated. Right? It's a <laughs> but this guy's no dummy. This guy is no dummy. He knows what he's getting into, and there are noxious fumes all over the place, so he has brought his trusty handkerchief. <laughs> so if I'm, if I'm poking at this, I'll make sure that I cover my nose and my mouth so I get home safely to, to make this print for us all to enjoy today. I'll just throw that over there. <laughs> now, I really think we should thank uh, Bill Ashworth for putting together this uh, marvelous exhibition. Um, yes. Where, where is he? Uh, um, he is an expert in the history of science. I am not. <laughs> Nor am I an expert in the history of art. And yet, here we are today to talk about the intersection of art and science. So what am I? Well, my father, he was a science guy, a real logical thinker. He was a math professor, uh, then became a dean of a, of a math department. Um, really just a lover of philosophy and the sciences, Latin scholar. My mother, well, she taught Western civilization for much of her life and art history. And so as a result of those two philosophies, you get me. <laughs> I mean, I've been invited here to talk about the intersection of art and science because I am an intersection of <laughs> art and science. This is me in 1983 drawing Smurfs. I've always, or coloring Smurfs. I've always been someone who likes to think and likes to draw. And whether drawing be uh, tree frogs in Costa Rica with an Eco Explorers scientific illustration program with my university, this is when I was a freshman at Michigan, or a few years later as a senior when I went off to Africa with them and uh, drew some women who were 
working at a fish market in Mozambique. There's a, this, this piece reminds me of a piece I saw in here uh, when a Captain Ross was traversing the Northwest Passage and there was this first encounter with the Inuits. And there, in, the, in a book I got to see down in the stacks, there's this great passage where Captain Ross is describing the incident and he says like, they were uneasy at first when I was drawing, uh, but then they realized that they could identify themselves in the picture and, and identify each of their homes and all rejoiced or something. And <laughs> the same thing happened here. I mean, uh, many tourists come through with a camera and they're taking pictures and it's very off-putting and a lot of people like, it's just, it, it, um, it, it creates a very kind of predatory atmosphere and yet I'm here with a, a sketchbook and I'm drawing and I can see that and something they can relate to and they were all smiles. And I went over and talked to each of the women afterwards and you can see kind of up by their heads that each wrote their names by their, their portrait um, in the picture. Or, uh, I mean, I draw when I travel, I draw anything and it doesn't have to be uh, like incredible masterpiece, I kind of think about drawing like photography um, in the sense that if National Geographic photographers take thousands of pictures, maybe 12 end up in the magazine, but they're always shooting, they're working a scene, they're looking. Uh, they might take a hundred pictures of one um, experience or one scene just to find that one, you know, after they've been working and they find, the, they, they find the great angle. So that's what I do with drawing. I just draw all the time. I draw multiple sketches of one scene, hoping that um, eventually one of those will be, you know, worth keeping. And so I was out patrolling around Kansas City today, and I'm not saying this one's worth keeping, but, you know, it was just part of my process of working. I, I really, like, kind of wandered over to the, uh, uh, Cancer Survivors Park on 47th Street, and it just so happened, and they've got these great words. I don't know if you've been there, but they've got these great words kind of cut out in relief. Uh, hope, live, seek, love, cure, and then labor dispute. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you're killing the mood, guys. <laughs> Move a block away. <laughs> anyway, so I, uh, I'm not an expert in the history of art, I'm not an expert in the history of science, and I therefore uh, am a little embarrassed to admit how little I knew about lithography uh, <laughs> prior to coming here today. Um, <laughs> and, and so it's been wonderful to, to learn by looking at the exhibition, but the reason why I'm a little embarrassed is because lithography is the intersection of art and science. It's really where, um, scientists were pioneering terms like hydrophilic and hydrophobic and yet using that to produce incredible beautiful images that you see in the exhibition. Um, but I'd like to put kind of the history of uh, lithography in a little bit of context. So uh, is anyone familiar with Google Ngram Viewer? It's this great tool where you can put in terms and see how, when those terms appeared in the history of like all published books or at least all the published books that Google has uh, already archived. And so if you type in fine arts and graphic arts, or as we now call it in the past, you know, 50 years or so, graphic design, you start to see, okay, the blue line that's just all over the charts from 1700 till today is fine arts, all right? Fine arts, everyone's doing it. Then around 1880, you start to see this graphic arts idea start showing up in the literature, and then a, a little yellow line pops up where people stop saying graphic arts and they say graphic design. Well, where is this graphic arts term coming from? Well, if you drop lithography on there, you see between 1810, 1820, this some people are talking about, but it's really in the middle of the 18th century, or middle of the 19th century that it starts to pick up some traction and it's like you know, far more prevalent in the literature than the term graphic arts. But then I was looking at this and I was thinking, there's something wrong here. What, I mean, even though lithography was taking off, what was happening between 1840 and 1860 that suddenly fine arts just like <clears throat> plummets down in the literature? Anyone know? Photography. Yes, photography, this purple line comes in here and just like, I mean, if you go back and you look at the y-axis scale over here, Photography just recalibrates the scale uh, in, the, in its popularity. So that's kind of a shame. <laughs> As someone who, I mean, I love photography, but I also love fine art. And um, 
anyway, again, it's great to see lithography alive uh, today in 2013. Um, but, all right, so we've got photography coming on the rise, and it's coming around here to 1880 or so, and you start to see a spike. And what happened around 1888? Anyone know? All right, a lot of things happened in 1888, I'm, I can assure you. Um, but this happened. This is the first issue of National Geographic magazine. I mean, this should have been at the forefront of your mind, people. I'm disappointed. Um, all right, so this is the first issue. We are celebrating our 125th anniversary this year, 2013. They've got all sorts of great uh, programs going on if you're ever in Washington. But the interesting thing is that even though photography was starting to take off on those charts I just showed you, there were no photographs in the first issues of National Geographic magazine. Uh, in fact, mostly it was this august scientific journal and they used a lot of information graphics. Uh, like this one, this was in the very, very first issue. Uh, this is looking at barometric pressure and some storms over the Atlantic and okay, you can see why it doesn't have the readership. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have today, uh, again, right, ISO lines, fascinating stuff, but actually pretty sophisticated information graphics uh, for 1888. But then he starts getting some really novel forms that, I mean, could compete with some of the great graphics you might see in the magazine today or the New York Times or some of the other, like, award-winning publications for data visualization. I mean, this is looking at population and immigration. And it starts off there at the top, and then slowly as the population grows, you see these new uh, demographics emerging you know, uh, at the end of the 19th century with the German and the Irish. And it's a very contemporary and slick uh, form for visualizing data. Uh, this one, while impenetrable, is <laughs> also kind of sophisticated, looking at, again, immigration from all the different cities, and you see these, like, big bands when there are more immigrants coming in uh, and then shrinking um, from Germany. There's a detail here, Italy, Scandinavia. So in fact, the first photographic series that we come to know and love from National Geographic didn't actually appear in the magazine until 1905 when desperate for pages and on deadline, or ways to fill pages and on deadline, the editor uh, kind of scrambled together these pictures he had just received uh, from Tibet. And this was from one of the first, this was the first photographic coverage story in National Geographic Magazine in 1905. And board members resigned. Like, the, 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 the whole prospect of sullying this scientific journal with illustrations for children uh, <laughs> forced a number of board members to resign, and, you know, I guess they couldn't see what was coming. <laughs> um, but about 20 years before that, of course, uh, some other things were happening um, that would lead to the National Geographic magazine that we know today. You've got, in France, you've got Georges Seurat, 1884, poking around with pointillism, and this idea of using different colors and combining them optically to create other colors. And at the same time, Around the same time, you've got James Clerk Maxwell experimenting with uh, color wheels and figuring out that like, actually red, green, and blue in visible light combine together to uh, form white and light, as opposed to what everyone had been taught for a while, red, yellow, and blue. When you're mixing paint, well, with light, it's actually red, green, and blue, and that's why our TVs and our computers all use the RGB color space. Anyway, these uh, you know discoveries with uh, light led to what we're seeing in lithography, uh, CMYK printing, where you got cyan, magenta, yellow, and then K being black, and how that could combine together, just like in pointillism, to form every color, or most every color necessary uh, to print things. And when you look at chromolithographs, like in this exhibition, it's that same principle of printing, say, four colors, a cyan plate, a magenta plate, a yellow plate, and a black plate, and using tons of little dots, just like Surat and pointillism, you get uh, all the different colors. So if you zoom in on the cover of National Geographic magazine, really every color is just a bunch of these little CMYK dots. Now, this is how the magazine is printed today. We don't use limestone. That wouldn't really work for, 
40 million uh, issues uh, just in, uh, yeah, really, that wouldn't work. And we, even photolithography, which you know, started to emerge in the 20th century, that uh, wasn't really cutting it either. So in the 90s, we got desktop publishing, and it's all digital lithography, where uh, the images are then pressed down onto these plates in a process um, that is called offset printing, where the plate runs through, gets ink and water on it, and then it hits up onto a blanket, and then it's offset then down onto the paper, because if it was just the plate with the water on it onto the paper, the paper would get too wet, so they use this blanket to offset. And here it's ripping through the presses out in West Virginia where all the domestic versions of National Geographic are printed. Black first, then cyan's added on on top, then magenta, and then yellow on top. Now that's what we use for what we call the front and the back of the book. Um, but when our readership got so high and circulation got so high, it became inefficient to actually use offset at traditional lithography because uh, these blankets can only handle so many impressions. Um, so we moved back to an older printing process, intaglio or engraving, using these cylinders with a copper shell around them, which have a diamond, there's a diamond cutter that uses a little diamond um, thing to etch in uh, the plates onto these copper cylinders, and then the copper cylinders spin in a giant uh, bath of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black ink, and that's what produces all the rich photography with like s that great smell when you open up the magazine and, and that, uh, that rich, deep color value you get in photographs like this one, which is, a leopard seal, a mother leopard seal coming to uh, play with, actually, uh, photographer Paul Nicklin. He spent so much time down in the water with the leopard seals that uh, this one mother came to think of him as a starving infant. <laughs> she, couldn't, she, she would bring these penguins by, and she would catch penguins and bring them by and toss them at them, but she wouldn't kill them. <laughs> She would get them kind of like near, like maim them, and then just toss them at them, and she would wonder why this photographer or this thing was not eating the penguin she was giving to him. And so finally, uh, she went up and she just killed one, came up and dropped it on top of his <laughs> camera housing, just force feeding the penguin to Paul Nicklin. <laughs> I've uh, always believed that the sciences and the arts are really not that different. Part of that's how I was raised, but I think we're all familiar with the scientific method and how first scientists go out there and they make tons of observations, and then from that they go, hmm, I got a hypothesis, I got this theory of how things might work, and, I'm, and then it makes a prediction, and okay, now we'll do a ton of experiments to see whether or not I'm a genius or not, and when I find out that I'm not a genius, well, I'm gonna deny that for a little bit and, and analyze what went wrong until I can prove to the world with more experiments that I am actually, in fact, a genius. Well, artists have been using this process uh, for the longest time. I mean, started back, I mean, my mother would say it started with the Greeks, but let's just for the sake of time start with Leonardo and the Last Supper. <laughs> and they were, they're, they're experimenting with mathematical perspective. I mean, artists are doing math. Everyone, everyone heard that. Yeah, artists are doing math and they're out there figuring out, okay, how can we, you know, how can we get on paper what we're actually seeing? And so for a while, the idea was, okay, we'll use math and we'll figure out this like Western set of rules and one point, two point, three point perspective. And then, you know, you move on and there's other people experimenting, uh, like Edward Moybridge, who is trying to settle with photography this long-standing debate that in, when a horse is at full gallop, its legs are not out like this. <laughs> I mean, this was the thing. That's how Edward Moybridge got to start. The governor of California hired him to settle a quarrel. He and like a bunch of his other horse owning buddies had this debate that like, nah, I think the legs are out. And the other guy's like, no, they're in like this. And like, uh, like, well, well, we got this new guy. He's taking all these pictures in Yosemite. I'll get him to go out and prove me right that I'm a genius. So he went out and he did this in 18, early 1870s and proved that, yes, Governor Stanford was right when a horse is at full gallop, his legs are actually turned in, not the way Jericho had painted it earlier in the 19th century. But yeah, so artists are always experimenting. I mean, Picasso, when he blew the world open at age 26, uh, was thinking about how we see. This wasn't just about like, being different. This was really uh, 
an experiment, a scientific experiment in how we see, just like Cezanne was doing. It's not about Western 1 point, 2 point, 3 point perspective. After looking at all the Japanese woodcuts that were starting to come into Europe in the late 19th century and starting to look at African art, they started thinking, oh, well, maybe we actually experience the world in a different way. Maybe we can see multiple sides of the podium at one time. We're never just fixed. So that's what you're starting to get here, combining multiple perspectives at one point. And there are artists like David Hockney who would say that Cubism didn't end with Picasso in the early 20th century, that Cubism is still alive and well. It's the idea of trying to capture really how we move through the world, how we actually perceive things. And so Hockney in the early 80s was using Polaroids to you know, get, the, get at the multiplicity of experience of his friends looking at this is a double portrait of his two friends, but as he's taking the Polaroids, he's putting them down on the ground, and the entire experience is actually really meta and getting captured in the work. Hockney's still tackling this problem today with a whole series of multi-panel paintings where, you know, this may look like Leonardo's Last Supper in one-point perspective, but it's really not. You, it's more like reality. I mean, I'm looking at you here, but I'm also looking at you here, and I'm looking at you here. And in Hockney's Woolgate Woods here, you're looking down this trail, you're looking down this trail, you're looking down this trail. It's more realistic. So Hockney would say that uh, we, we used to be able to speak of arts and sciences in the same breath, and now we get this. We get arts and leisure. And I'm kind of <laughs> curious, so what happened? <laughs> What, how can we get back to speaking of art and science together in the same breath? Well, at National Geographic, that's something that uh, I tried to do when I was there and my former colleagues continue uh, to work on. Uh, I'm going to show you now a few examples of observation, hypothesis, prediction, experiments, and analysis at National Geographic, or as it really should be called, trial and error. <laughs> All right, we'll start off with a fun one. Uh, this is me making oil paintings of another sort. Um, we wanted to do a story about oil, suspension, oil prevention uh, techniques and, and discoveries, um, technologies since Exxon Valdez. And so when we were commemorating kind of that 20th anniversary a few years ago uh, and celebrating the ways in which they've limited the number of oil spills that have happened, we thought we should do a story on it. We don't want to illustrate oil spills in the same old way of uh, you know, oil-covered birds and slicks on the water. So I thought we'll make our own spill. So in the photo studio, I got some crude oil off a tanker from Venezuela and just started making these oil paintings. Uh, I mean, who knew? It's trial and error. We'll see what happens. Jackson Pollock, homage there, I suppose. <laughs> and when you find out when you're painting with this stuff, I mean, this is not like tempera paint. And when you tip the bottle over, I mean, it takes like a full minute for this thick plastic goop to drizzle all the way down in these thin strands of the ground and really seeing that firsthand and inhaling it like our friend at Mount Vesuvius. Uh, <laughs> I, I realized just, I mean, what those pelicans are going through when they have this substance on their feathers. This was the piece that we ended up using in the magazine. Jackson Pollock would have been a little too busy for the page, uh, so we went with just a big old puddle of oil. Uh, another piece, uh, Baylor University and the EPA were doing a study about pharmaceuticals and how they found it in test sites all around the country that the pharmaceuticals we ingest were starting to show up in the liver and flay tissue of fish. And outside of Chicago, they were showing up in largemouth bass. So it was obvious to me that I needed to at least try to make a fish out of pills. So we had a casting call of sorts asking everyone in the office to donate their prescription medications uh, for a proof of concept to see if this would work. And so here I am you know, at my desk trying to figure out uh, if I can actually make a recognizable largemouth bass out of pills, Prozac and such. And this is what I got. And we ended up photographing in the studio, but then my creative director had this brilliant idea that it shouldn't just be this random art piece, that I should actually make the fish in the, with the pills in the proportions that they were found in the study. Great idea, really hard. <laughs> so uh, 
first we had to find where we were going to get the pills because this couldn't, a National Geographic, we don't cut corners, so this couldn't be, uh, like, this couldn't be rendered in Photoshop or 3D and we weren't going to use, like, sugar pills. Like, we were going to use Prozac. We were, I mean, this had to be the real thing. So I came up with this, like, massive spreadsheet of all the different permutations to keep the percentages right. So if I needed, like, 75% of this and 30% of this, then, like, this is how many pills I would use. And, and then we set up shop in a pharmacy after hours and using the actual pills, this is what happened. That's my head. And then lots of rearranging and adjustment. And then eventually, this is the final piece that we printed in the magazine. Got uh, anti-hypertensive in the air bubbles, antidepressants in all the green pills, antihistamines in the dark pink pills, and a uh, anti-seizure medicine in all the underbelly lighter pink pills. Now, the trace amounts, you know, you can still go out and eat fish if you want to, the trace amounts, but it's significant scientific research to show that, like, this transmission is, in fact, happening to some degree. Um, sometimes it all starts with a sketch. I was on a flight cross-country to visit my brother, and then I had heard about these mental athletes who can memorize, just like old Roman orators like Cicero and stuff, could memorize these long strings of digits and numbers and could memorize the deck, uh, the order of a deck of playing cards in like under a few minutes. And so I contacted a few of them and I, they told me their process was to envision this like mental palace, this memory palace. So if you imagine Linda Hall Library as a memory palace, they would code each one of the cards in the playing deck with some absurd image like Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, lifting barbells uh, or Michael Jackson swallowing a sword or something. And uh, by plotting these weird scenes all throughout, say, Linda Hall Library, and then retracing their steps as they walked through the library, they could remember the order of all the cards. And so I thought, oh, we got to do this. We got to, like, take the mental palace of one of these recent memory champions and show this with our readers. So uh, I took all the cards and the, and the codes that one of the recent champions had given me, and I started like mapping out what his mind palace looked like. And this is what we ended up uh, running in the magazine last year. So here you see the ace of spades, uh, queen of spades, and nine of spades or clubs uh, codes to Arnold Schwarzenegger dancing with a car. And then he puts that up there in his bathroom. So. Um, sometimes uh, our graphics start with just mind-numbing strings of data in massive spreadsheets. This one was one I got from uh, researchers at the University of Reading in the UK, and they were studying word evolution, how language evolves across 87 Indo-European languages. And they, had, they were, had this hypothesis that maybe some parts of speech, some words are more stable than others, that some across all languages are pretty similar to the way they originated, and then others are more uh, dynamic and have evolved over time. And so they gave me this gobbledygook, and I started experimenting with it, thinking like, okay, let's plot um, all the different words. They studied 200 words in this particular study, and this just looked like a mess. You know, I was kind of, kind of thinking, Blue would be slowly evolving words, and red would be rapidly, rapidly evolving, but it just didn't look very good. So then I started, okay, I'll color it by part of speech. That's what I'll do, but that just made it even messier. So then I started thinking, all right, we'll, we'll group it by the number of languages that, that have the same root of each word. And then I started putting them on these curving arcs, and it was getting somewhere, but this is just, I mean, your eyes are crossing, I can tell. That people are just... <laughs> getting up and leaving right now. So then I uh, decided, oh, we have to group things together. Grouping is a great way to organize stuff. I mean, it's pretty basic, but it, I group things by part of speech. And so here in the center, you still have the most stable words, words that are shared by all 87 Indo-European languages. And out on the exterior, the smaller words are the words that, have, that don't have a common root. And those are less stable and have been rapidly evolving over time. Anyway, that's how we turn data into uh, a little bit prettier information graphics. Then there are also things like this, these photo shoots, where National Geographic really goes above and beyond what a lot of people would do. But again, it's trial and error. 
um, we wanted to do a study on Neanderthals. There was some new research coming out about female Neanderthals and, and what their uh, behaviors might have been like. So we hired a team of artists called the Kenneth Brothers, and they produced Wilma. Uh, that's what we call her. And it started out by ordering bones from a company called Bone Clones, uh, an osteological reproduction specialist out in California. And then they built up flesh all around her bones and then built up uh, uh, like a more of a skin substance over top of that. And then they took Wilma to Spain because it's, they wanted to photograph Wilma in exactly the place where her fossil evidence had been discovered. But the problem is it's too green, it's too lush. When Neanderthals were patrolling that part of Spain, uh, you know, it was a much colder, there was more ice and stone. So trial and error, we had to, on the fly, figure out a new place to photograph Wilma. So photographer Joe McNally and art director Juan Velasco and Bill Maher, they hauled Wilma over uh, through the jungle, tried a few other locations, that still wasn't good enough. So then they picked her up, hauled her through the pastures, and found this place up in the mountains. And they realized to get a good shot over there on those rocks, which would do just fine, uh, they probably had to be there at sunrise. So they snuck in before the park was open, hauling Wilma in, in bubble wrap here with their headlamps. Uh, <laughs> sun's just starting to come up, but it's not in the right place yet. It's just hitting the hillside. And you can see, I don't know if you can see, it's pretty dark here, but Wilma's down in this area. And then finally, this is a shot that ran in the magazine. Wow. Wilma in her natural element. Uh, the park officials arrived uh, shortly thereafter, and there was some explaining to do. I'll give you one last example from National Geographic. Uh, my art friend of mine, artist, Fernando Baptista, he's really a master of trial and error. He gets out there and is always tinkering, always experimenting, never satisfied, and the results, well, they're memorable. I don't know if you saw this, but this was a piece that ran last July uh, on how the Moai were made and moved you know, on Easter Island. That's Fernando, but Fernando didn't just like look in a few books or surf a few websites. He actually went to Easter Island and worked with the archeologists to test out some of their new theories that maybe, maybe in fact, they had a bunch of ropes and they kind of rocked the Moai back and forth like moving your refrigerator down the street. So that's Fernando there in, uh, in the middle with a hat on. And he came back home with all his sketches and photographs from his experience there and started doing a bunch of sketches, experiments hypothesis. And he had this idea that if he made a clay model that, you know, maybe uh, he could get a pretty accurate lifelike recreation. And this is what ended up running in the magazine. Now, it, we, run, we show a bunch of different theories down here at the bottom, um, some of the ones that have been disputed and some of the newer ones over on the right, but we could do better than that. I mean, yeah. What if, Fernando thought, we animated this? What if we showed people, let them watch the theories unfold, let them watch the science? So he started building a set, got a bunch of action figures, <laughs> wrestlers just raided the toy stores for wrestler action figures and hand painted each one, gave them little hair pieces, made them into little Easter Island <laughs> characters, and set about uh, to make some, a stop motion uh, process of scientific research and all of its trial and error. And I would like to share that with you this evening. Although some believe extraterrestrials move the Moai, scientists have more earthbound theories. The 
Norwegian Thor Heyerdahl led a team to drag a 13-foot, 10-ton Moai on a tree trunk. <sighs> William Malloy used a desktop model to postulate the use of an inverted wooden V. But oral tradition says the statues walked. Czech engineer Pavel Pavel worked with Heyerdahl to move a statue with a twisting motion. Charles Love stood his Moai upright on a sledge over rollers. Hmm. But stories of the walking statues persisted. So Terry Hunt and Carl Lippo tried a new approach. They said three small groups could have walked to Moai, two to rock the statue forward and one from behind to stabilize it. In 2011, 18 people walked a 10-foot statue using this technique. While no one theory has proven the mode of locomotion, it's a new look at what may have happened centuries ago. They did an incredible job, and I will not forget that. And uh, I think it's just a beautiful, beautiful example of the intersection of art and science. Now, uh, I've come to, as I've been saying, think of the artistic method much like the scientific method, but I also think that same method of observations and hypotheses and experiments can be applied to our lives as well. And under that kind of rubric, I could consider my last nine to 10 years as experiments around one hypothesis uh, of my time at National Geographic. But lately, a new, or in the past couple of years, a new hypothesis emerged. And it all started when I started work on a project uh, in 2010 in Washington, D.C. called the Museum of Unnatural History. <laughs> now, you may be asking yourself, what is a museum of unnatural history? And I'll tell you, it is not only a museum of unnatural wonders, but it is also a creative writing and tutoring center for kids in inner city DC. It's part of a larger national network of creative writing centers started by the author Dave Eggers in 2002. There's one in San Francisco, there's one in Ann Arbor, one in New York, and when one, and there's a few others, this is the eighth chapter, and when they were coming to DC, me and my a friend and I got together and came up with this idea. And we worked with an incredible team of volunteers to turn a space that looked like this. This was a for-profit tutoring center uh, with blue carpeting with A pluses in it, uh, where creativity and learning goes to die, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and turned it into this. And this is the front area. This is our Museum of Unnatural History, where we sell all sorts of 
novelty projects and have exhibits and an interactive cave that kids can go into and make their own chalk and cave art, uh, weird skeletons, taxidermies, murals, what have you. And then in the back, we turned a space that looked like this. Fluorescent lighting, drop ceilings, more nasty carpet into this. A warm, creative environment where kids can come in, get homework help, they can work on poetry, um, work with tutors to get their stories published, and we put out anthologies every year of, of their best work, and when kids come in for workshops, they actually leave with a, their stories uh, bound up in a published document. And illustrators come in and illustrate the stories for the kids, so they, they really feel like uh, not only are they producing something um, and they're being recognized for it, but it's also fun, warm space, and there's you know, animals hanging from the ceiling. Um, up front, this uh, weird skeleton was just another experiment of mine where I thought we needed to have a centerpiece in the museum. So I went back to that bone clone place that we used for the Neanderthal, and I got a kudu skull and a saber-toothed tiger rib cage, gorilla legs, a spider monkey tail, <laughs> manatee flippers, and a single fruit bat wing, and started assembling them in my living room. And there's my, there's my blueprint there on the, on the bottom. And uh, yeah, the hardest part, I think, was probably just the creepiness factor. <laughs> and I'll tell you, and I've said this before, that uh, if you ever decide to do a project like this and, and articulate a weird skeleton, uh, and you go to the hardware store and looking for a 12-inch drill bit, when the clerk asks you what you're trying to drill through, don't say bone. <laughs> so up front in the store, uh, people love coming in for all the novelty products we sell, like Unicorn Tears, uh, puts the sparkle and suffering. I think we changed that to sadness, because uh, you know, it's for the kids, you know. Um, and then we have all this sorts of fun posters uh, for sale. Um, this one is a species identification flowchart. So you start up, if you're a scientist out in the field and you come across this new thing, you start up there, is it devouring you? Uh, no, okay, no, it's not great. Can you see it? Uh, not all of it, or yeah, from the neck down, okay, it's me. All right. It's too small to see, yeah, it's a capable of movement, it's running away, chase it, keeping up with it, how many legs, four, is it slobbery, uh, yeah, it's a dog, oh wait, no, it's two, <laughs> they're two legs, but they're stubby, are the arms also stubby, it's holding my hand, it's a baby! <laughs> this is the work of the Unnatural Society. But the kids love it. They, uh, we made up these forms so that they could invent their own species um, and draw them and then think about, okay, where, what's its scientific name? Uh, where, where does it live? What does it eat? Uh, it's observed behavior, texting on the phone. Okay. <laughs> That's what bug bugs do, in case you didn't know. I think, do you have any lithographs of, of bug bugs in the stacks down there? But the kids, by, by far, their favorite thing in the entire Museum of Unnatural History is the interactive fossil dig, which is a box of sand um, with bones in it. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's very simple. We, uh, you, we make it out to be this box, uh, this trunk of forgotten treasures of all these different bones and fossils, and kids come in there and they just dig around and they find little pieces of vertebrae and other things, but they can't, they can't buy the bones they unearth, but they can barter for them by singing a song or telling a joke or doing a dance. And so you can't really describe the smile it puts on your face when you see a girl marching home down the street holding a femur that she's earned. <laughs> Not bought, earned. <clears throat> And it was with the fun and joy of this project where it was using art and science and art to explain science, to, to really open kids' minds and, and get them thinking about um, you know, all the different possibilities that maybe they aren't being exposed to. Maybe they don't feel comfortable going to uh, the bigger traditional museums in DC. That I started getting this idea, this hypothesis that maybe I could use my design work for more projects like that. And, um, in 2011, I met a man named Barrington Irving, Captain Barrington Irving, and he's the youngest person to have ever flown around the world solo. He did it at the age of 22, 
And he had had a scholarship to play football at the University of Florida. And one day, a pilot came into his parents' bookstore and asked him, hey, have you ever thought about being a pilot? And he said, no, you know, I'm not smart enough to be a pilot. And the guy said, come on, I could do it. If you're interested, like, I, you could see, I could show you, take you and your parents out, show you the planes, and you can see the cockpit. And you know what? Because I want to give back because of what people did for me, I'll pay for your first flight lesson. Well, he got hooked. He gave up the scholarship to play at the University of Florida, and he went on, raised money, learned how to fly, founded an organization in Miami called Experience Aviation that teaches kids all about STEM industries and how to fly, and gives them opportunities just like he had that he wouldn't have had otherwise, and at the age of 22 became the youngest person to fly around the world solo. And I've been working, him, working with him on a new project. It's going to launch in 2014. It's called Classroom in the Sky, a Barrington Irving venture. We are taking a jet, and uh, Barrington is going to inspire the minds of kids, not only in Miami, but in schools all around the country and hopefully all around the world, by flying over four and a half months to all of these places, starting in Miami, heading up to New York, cutting over to Europe, down through the Great Rift Valley in Africa, across the subcontinent, down to Australia, up through Petropavac and Kamchatka into North America, down to South America, hop over to Antarctica, and then back up through the Amazon to his hometown in Kingston, Jamaica, and back to Washington, DC. He's one of National Geographic's emerging explorers, and he's invited me to go along as his field journalist and scientific illustrator. So when I walk through this exhibition of lithographs, I don't see the past, I see the future. I see uh, Captain Ross meeting the Inuit up uh, in the Northwest Passage, and I see the drawings that I want to make uh, in, in bring lithography and that sort of field expeditions back. I mean, photography has its place, but I really believe that there is a power to seeing work made by hand, that somebody was there, that somebody saw something. When you're drawing, it takes time you, you kind of start setting the stage, and then actors and events and things come onto the stage, and you add them in, like, you know, a man with a handkerchief. <clears throat> this was one of those uh, wonderful drawings where, uh, from Captain Ross's expedition, where they're first meeting the Inuit, and uh, they're drawing all their homes. And, you know, I can imagine how I would have drawn this if I were him. You know, I, I start, okay, we've got the sky, we've got these land masses, they're stable, we've got the homes, then some people come in, and then right as I'm about to say I'm finished with the drawing, this kid comes running down the slope <laughs> and balances out the composition. It's perfect. <clears throat> and. Uh, I just want to share with you one last project that I've been working on the past few weeks, an information graphic that really came from, as I was preparing for this talk, uh, I started thinking about the history of art and the history of science, and I started wondering, and you know, really are the creative processes that different? When do artists make their breakthroughs? When do they make their great works? For Picasso, he was 26. Cezanne was 67. Well, what about scientists? Is there a similar range, or is there kind of a peak age for scientific uh, breakthrough. So I started this new project, which I call My Lifelines. These, this is the lives of 177 visual artists, poets, composers, scientists, and software developers from Jado in the year 1300 all the way up till Mark Zuckerberg and David Karp, the founders of Facebook and Tumblr today. And I threw the software developers in there because I thought maybe like they would show like a counterpoint of, of, of production in your early 20s, and I wondered if that, that was similar in the other disciplines. And a couple of things I found out just in looking at this. Well, first of all, uh, this was not supposed to be some scientific comprehensive survey. This was my personal exploration, so I only plotted the lives of people whose work I experienced directly myself, either by reading it or seeing it or hearing it, or, you know, like in the case of Newton, well, gravity is all. Um, and for each person, I, I selected one signature work, just to see when, when that occurred in their lifetime. And what's going on here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we all start out to, let's see, I'm going to go back. 
we all start out together uh, in the center. You know, we're all born together, we're all one big huddled mass until about our 20s when we start to distinguish ourselves as we get older. And what I found is that uh, at age 22, when people are graduating, for most people are graduating from college, we're virtually all kind of untapped. Like very few of these 177 well-known artists, composers, poets, and scientists had really made any breakthroughs before age 22. Now we hear about Mozart composing at age five, but in fact, like his major operas were composed uh, later in his life. Um, what I did find though was that most of these dots, these black dots, their signature works, clustered between age 30 and age 50. This is what I call the donut of peak productivity. The, the colored areas right in there. And also found that uh, for you know, precocity, it seems, when it happens, seems to be a little bit contagious. Of all the works on this chart that were um, created before age 30, most tend to cluster together within three distinct periods. The revolutionary zeal of the early 19th century where you get Shelley, Keats, Jericho, Chopin. Uh, you get then the modern frenzy bracketing World War I with Picasso, Stravinsky, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Igor Stravinsky. And then, uh, of course, the recent tech boom of uh, the new millennium with Steve Jobs and Larry and Sergey and Mark Zuckerberg. Well, uh, what I also found when I was working on this, because I had set out to figure out when we make our best work, and I realized that I was actually asking the wrong question. Now, we each have an, an individual temperament, be it extroverted or introverted. Some of us are passive, some are aggressive, some are passive aggressive, you know, <laughs> some are fast starters, some are slow. So it doesn't really matter, actually, when we make our best work. Uh, but we all have unique life experiences and a unique timeline. And what's more interesting is why we make our work. So I started digging into that. And if you look at Cezanne, for instance, he grew up in Provence, spending sunny days as a child, hiking through quarries, uh, bathing in streams, and then uh, reading poetry under pine trees with his pal Emile Zola. So it's no coincidence he would cover and, and draw from these motifs for the rest of his life, culminating in the large bathers at age 67. And then even in music, uh, composers like Béla Bartók, to distance himself from the you know, established mainstream music coming out of Vienna and Berlin, he actually distanced himself. He went out and uh, you know, just went to, he was born in Hungary, explored the mountains of Hungary, Transylvania, Croatia, Turkey, Algeria, using the iPhone of his day, the phonograph or the Edison cylinder, to sample the sounds of local folk songs. And then he would come back and remix uh, those folk songs to create his compositions, like Three Village Scenes and some of his concertos. And this is uh, Thelo Bartok using the phonograph uh, in 1908 in a village to record some local dialect and, and songs. Um, then you get poets like Elizabeth Bishop, right? So it's not just where you're from, like Cezanne, or where you go, like Béla uh, Bartók. Sometimes what we make, why we make what we make, is because of circumstances out of our control, things that happen to us. Elizabeth Bishop, when she was eight months old, her father died, and her mother was institutionalized uh, shortly thereafter. So she went to live with her grandmother in Nova Scotia. An inheritance allowed her to travel and devote her energies to writing poetry. And at age 45, she wrote the beautiful Sestina, from which you see the first stanza here, uh, at age 45, where she's remembering and still processing her past. And then we're talking about scientists and talking about childhood influences. We've got to talk about Dr. Jane Goodall the precocious primatologist who in her 20s, her observations of tool using, tool making, meat eating chimps flipped a very scientific and patriarchal establishment on its head. And, but why chimps? Well, she came to develop a love for chimps and animals at a very, very early age. How early? When she was one, her father gave her a stuffed chimp doll from the London Zoo. Jane still has uh, 
the Tao with her, and like Dr. Goodall would do with the chimps she befriended in Gombe 25 years later, she, unlike anyone else had ever done in science, she gave her chimp a name, Jane Jubilee. So Cezanne, Bartok, Bishop, Goodall, and there's one other example I'd like to leave you with. It's a guy named Steve. You may know Steve. Steve grew up and lived by the sea in California, and Steve loved the ocean, and he went on to become a marine biologist, a marine biologist who likes to draw. Fifteen years later, from his time getting his job as a marine biologist, on May 1st, 1999, at the age of 38, Stephen Hillenberg, who'd been drawing creatures while working as a marine biologist, creatures like this, on May 1st, 1999, Stephen Hillenberg introduced the world to SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> you thought I was going somewhere else, didn't you? <laughs> now, now, all these people, <laughs> Cezanne, Bartok, Bishop, Goodall, Hillenberg, SpongeBob, we celebrate them not just for their work, but what their work represents, this dedication to a search and a deeply personal line of inquiry. And it's been a real honor to be able to come here and speak with you tonight about this intersection of art and science because I really believe that uh, this exhibition celebrates that search as well. You know, when you look at our friend here, you're celebrating the fact that uh, science and the technology of lithography has helped thousands of artists share their work with the world. But it's a real symbiotic relationship, art and science, because at the same time, artists, like many featured here tonight, and my colleagues at National Geographic are using their art to share with the world the discoveries of science. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few questions. If you raise your hand, I'll come by with the microphone. Hi, I have a, a question for you about um, photography merging with science. Mm -hmm. Um, you made a comment earlier about, and I, I can't remember exactly how you stated it, but it was, you know, that photography was really not an art form. That was very early on in your... Oh, when I was looking at the charts? Yes. You know, fine lecture. arts and photography. Yeah. But when art, I mean, I just want to make a comment, and I'd like you to respond to it. When art was first developed, like by Niepce, you know, and onward from the mid um, 1800s. There were so many arcane types of photography where photographers were not only looking at, you know, views that they wanted to permanently record, but they were also experimenting with a lot of scientific methodology. You know, if you look at albumen prints, you know, and all the arcane types of printing, I, I think, you know, Photography for me as an art historian really melds science and the process of looking at, you know, something that makes a permanent art image more than any other type of um, art. So I would just like for you to comment on that. Sure. Uh, I would not like to be mistaken uh, and for saying that I did not think photography was a fine art. I am a, I attend photography festivals every year. I have many friends who are photographers and photojournalists. I come from an institution that thinks photography is the only reason for being alive. I mean, I, uh, I have great admiration for photography and all that it can do. And, and many, many of our photographers, uh, like David Lischwager and Robert Clark, um, are using photography, I mean, most of them are using it for, the, for science and for, to increase and diffuse understanding and knowledge of our world. Um, so please do not take anything from this talk as some sort of uh, slam on photography. I, what I am saying, and, and 
in a celebration of the reason why we're all here tonight, lithography, is that I do believe there's still room um, when photography is dominating, you know, the internet and our, our visual space, when everywhere we look, we seem to be seeing images that are all made by cameras. I think there is still room for images made by hand, be it by lithographs or pencils, crayons, whatever. So, and, and, and I think definitely cameras can communicate that human to human experience. There's no question about that, but I also believe that when you see a work, like in any one of these lithographs, that was clearly made by someone standing and looking at something, there's a connection and transmission made that I personally find very, very valuable. Uh, not too many years ago, uh, it was not uncommon for every research facility to have a uh, staff scientific illustrator. Um, that's pretty much vanished with, uh, with the various kinds of microphotography and, and other photography that are uh, available. Uh, is there a future for the scientific illustrator in, uh, in the uh, hard science uh, uh, publishing and research? I think scientists need artists and designers now more than ever. I mean, there's so much data being collected, there's a lot of data being shared, that artists and designers have a, again, as I mentioned at the end, it's a symbiotic relationship. They have an ability to help scientists get their findings across clearly and visually to a lay audience. We can help do the translation for you. It was one of my greatest joys, National Geographic, to be able to call up a scientist or a researcher anywhere in the world and say, hey, I read about your data in a journal and I would love to help you visualize it. And they get so excited and they just, you know, here, here's everything. And we, and we have this great conversation. I ask a lot of stupid questions just so I can like really understand it and process it so I can make it clear for the reader. And I think uh, students who are graduating now have an interest in science and have an interest in art, they have opportunities in a lot of different ways to uh, partner with scientists in that way. Um, we at National Geographic and, the New York and at the New York Times and a number of institutions are lucky to have a staff of graphic artists who do just that, but um, there are opportunities all over the place. Wherever there are scientists, there's a need for people to help uh, simplify and visualize their, their messages. You gave us tonight an extraordinary view of creativity, the early beginnings of art, and the development of science. But science today is an interdisciplinary approach to discovery. What you showed us now is the way photography as an interdisciplinary medium also could be used for new forms of creativity or discovery. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on that, please? The question is, whether or not photography could be used in a similar way to help uh, explain scientific principles? Yes, because an artist develops his own way of doing things, and his uniqueness of it is recognized as art or just pedantic use of the medium. But what you showed us tonight was what could happen with more than one person in the art form of different media can create new forms of art? Well, I heard a designer, Stefan Sagmeister, say a great thing when I, I heard him speak a few months ago, and, and he said that uh, you know, design has to work, art does not. Sometimes, uh, I find myself kind of right in the middle of that, but at photography, it depends on what your intent is. I mean, photography is kind of right in the middle too. I mean, you can definitely have art photography that is evocative and emotive and you know, doesn't have to say work. It doesn't have to communicate a, a function like, say, a, a design project does. But at the same time, then there's another type of photography and that's what you see in a lot of photojournalism and what we really, um, perfected, I think, at, at National Geographic was a way to, to make photography work, to collaborate, to work with scientists. I mean, 
many of our scientists, like Paul Nicklin, who I showed you with the leopard seal, and Brian Scarry, I mean, they started off as scientists. They started off as marine biologists. They came to know and love the oceans and the animals there. So when then they picked up cameras, they knew what they were getting into. Right? So I think, I think that's already happening. Which is, there's already a collaboration between photographers and scientists. Um, and I just, and there used to be a lot of collaboration between artists and scientists, like visual artists and scientists, and I'm kind of hoping to see more of that moving forward. You know, I've, I hope that, did that answer your question? A little bit, no? Okay. Uh, back here on your left. Hi, I know that uh, you've indicated there's a symbiotic relationship between, you know, uh, your work and the scientists. How often do you need scientists to help you express what you want to see? Like you have an idea, but you need to maybe get some more technical or scientific information and, and express it that way. Sure. So um, that, that happens as well. Sometimes it starts with an idea. I'm trying to think of a good example, but um, I kind of have a thing that we could do. And then it's a question of like, yeah, okay, who, who's an expert? And so then you go out and start reading journals on the topic and you find experts at universities, and that's like they are the expert on this type of fossil or this data. But, and lately, I've been working a lot with um, researchers uh, at the University of College in London on a, on a bunch of information graphic projects. And I've always been kind of interested in happiness studies. It's like this big pop psych thing these days. Uh, are people happy? How, can you rate? Uh, I was going to show it tonight and didn't, but like. You know, I had made my own charts for a little while, just tracking like my happiness from day to day on a scale of one to 11. And, and I did that for about six months. And you know, the good news is that like bad days are very fleeting, right? That, like you never have like three bad days in a row. It always comes right back. But you know, happy days are like super happy days are also usually followed by a, a drop. Um, in any case, so that was an idea that I was curious about. But I just, I didn't have enough data on my own to do anything with it. And I found through my friends in London, this data set from the London School of Economics where these researchers had um, gotten 50,000 participants in a study to get an app on their phone that pinged them twice a day for a year to rate uh, how happy they felt. And then they were able to, uh, I might even be able to pull it up here if you have a moment. Um, they were able to then show, uh, let's see if I Got this potential. Where is it? Oh, you're seeing all the dirty behind the <laughs> scenes stuff. Uh, happiness. I don't know if I can get this full screen. But this is 100,000 data points from a year of the happiness of Londoners. And, you know, blue, you know, blue, sad, yellow, happy. And you see this pattern emerge. From you know, you got September at the top and August at the bottom, the morning here and then evening over there, and uh, there's this alternating band. And can anyone guess what's happening in this alternating band of blue and yellow? Weekend. Yeah, weekends. <laughs> Four times a month, there's a thin yellow strip, and then right around Christmas, you got this big yellow band, and then notice not New Year's Day, but New Year's Eve, there's this, this little burst of yellow at the end, and then Easter holiday, and then this data was all collected in 2011, so there's this mysterious third yellow band cutting across uh, all of late April, and that was the royal wedding. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes you got an idea, and you just got to go find the data and the experts to work with you on. Oliver, back here by the reference desk. Sure. Your upcoming trip around the world with your captain friend sounds absolutely thrilling. Couple of questions. Sure. One, can I come too? <laughs> and two, will someone be blogging or uh, posting some of your, your work that you're doing along the way so we can kind of join you even if uh, from a removed position? Sure, that's the whole um, premise of Classroom in the Sky is that we, we want to build a school bus with wings and take students all around the world with us. There are certain legal liability issues that prohibit that. So we are tricking out the jet with all sorts of Wi-Fi capability, working with NASA and a few other uh, institutions so that we will be able to be transmitting uh, from the cockpit, having phone calls with uh, Captain Irving 
And I, as the visual journalist, journalist will probably be the one doing a lot of the blogging and dispatching um, from the field. So there's a lot of things we're still working out. Um, but right now, we're scheduled to depart in September 2014. This is um, I wanted to uh, make a comment, and uh, you brought it, you alluded to it very briefly here just a minute ago. Um, my background is as a surgeon, mm -hmm. and I was went to the University of Michigan, the medical school, as <laughs> undergraduate, and. The uh, Department of Anatomy had a section of medical illustration there, which was <laughs> sensational. And the reason that the, uh, these medical illustrations were so important, and some have become classics of Frank Netter's work, was that as a student studying anatomy, you could not look at a photograph <laughs> of a specimen to try and figure out the anatomy. The simplicity that was introduced by the medical illustrator in doing these elegant anatomic plates really brought into perspective the anatomy that then allowed you to go into the lab and learn the anatomy. It would have been impossible with photographs to have gained either a fresh specimen or cadaver type specimen to understand that. And I think that's a simplicity which is introduced, which is a, uh, exactly where there's an intersection of science and illustration, which is very important. And if you look at some of the old anatomic atlases where these uh, illustrators uh, did their work, they uh, really are works of art hmm. and uh, very informative. I don't know if these programs on medical illustration still exist or not. But, uh, yeah, but unfortunately, the terrific. University of Michigan's medical illustration program, which was one of the top in the country, that it, it, it closed down, and it, I was there during the, the end of it. I was studying scientific illustration and, and graphic design, but I knew a number of medical illustrators, and I saw their work, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the way they could articulate the, the detail of, a, of an eye surgery, for instance, and have that editorial judgment of what to leave out, I mean, that's what makes it simple for you to understand, is labeling and knowing, okay, that artistic creative license of okay, let that, I'll leave that out, I'll leave this area blank. And in a lot of my sketches, it's a similar thing. I mean, I'm drawing the, the, the cancer park here in Kansas City, the Cancer Survivor Park, and you don't have to draw every building, but you only you know, focus on the same elements. And if you're doing something that's instructional, that's trying to show geography, or trying to show a pattern, like the happiness pattern, or trying to show a process, like a surgery, it helps to have an artist, as you're saying, who uh, edits and decides what to keep in. And sometimes photography includes everything, and you don't need everything for every purpose. So. Thank you, Oliver. Thanks. I know there were a couple of hands up, but due to the time, we have to uh, cut it short tonight. But thank you for attending tonight's lecture. Please join us April 16th for our Paul D. Bartlett Senior Lecture with Sean Carroll. I, let me give you a heads up. Tickets are going very fast, and we'll be probably be closing registration soon. So go online, lindahall.org Linda tonight, and sign up for tickets. Thank you, and good night. Thanks. Thanks. That was wonderful. Oh, I didn't it. That's fun.